been walking through the Navy Exchange and wonder why all the Naval Pride and Heritage gear is horrifically ugly and you wouldn't actually wear it. Have you ever wanted some really cool gear and you just don't know where to go? Well, I got you, fam. Go to dgutsapparel.com immediately. Get yourself some Naval Pride and Heritage gear you'll actually wear in public. Uh, we're working on new designs all the time, open to ideas. We're trying to create a brand that uh, lets you display that pride, but doesn't make you cringe. Uh, also, if you're willing to and you're able to, please go to patreon.com slash podcast. Pick one of the five tiers and become a patron today. A little precursor to the podcast. About 90 seconds in to this one, I don't know what happened, but my uh, main microphone like glitched and... Uh, the audio was recorded by the built-in on my computer, so it does not sound like it normally does. Uh, and I apologize for that fact. I'm going to do my best uh, in like post-production to make it sound better, but it's going to sound not as great as normal. You know, I apologize. It's I, I'm going to release it anyway, but I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. Like I, I'm not sure what happened. I'm investigating, <laughs> but uh, heads up. The audio gets rough at about the 90 second point. What's up, everybody? Let's spin some yarn. Uh, I am going to go over uh, the initial Chief's Initiation memo. It's kind of general. Um, I mean, they are all, all are extremely vague and don't really say a hell of a lot. But this one's kind of, I don't know, it's very, it's almost like a cover letter for the rest of them. So there's not a ton to dig into, but I'm, I'm going to go through this one first as its own thing and then I'm just going to like use the rest of this uh spin the yarn to talk about season related things that have been on my mind um just based on interactions with selects and other chiefs and things I'm seeing and reading these memos just kind of a like an aggregate analysis of all the things I've had a lot going kind of going on in my brain that I just want to discuss I guess and just share and and get that kind of those ideas out of my head as well so first um it's a very this this memo itself again it's more like a cover cover letter kind of introducing the idea that he's going to be releasing a, a memo every two weeks and uh expects that everybody it says all chief petty officers and cps selectees are required to be present during discussions about each one that are mandatory uh, do not consider this a select e training, but as a mess discussion, we must have uh, to seek out areas where real change is needed and get after it. So that part's cool. Um, cool. Like, I like the idea of um, forcing those discussions. So it's like an it's like a tiny baby step in the right direction. I guess it's like it's nice that he's he's forcing some kind of action and accountability for these memos. Like, I expect you to get together and have a discussion. Um, not the biggest fan of that idea because it's like, I don't, I don't know. It's it, absent like policy absent, like a, a redefinition of our identity and the, and the guiding principles like mission vision guiding principles, which I, I mean, I think are pretty solid as is. I just think it needs to be hammered home that these are what you should be striving for, which I don't think we do that enough, but it's like, they're going to, when I read, I, I read a little bit of the character one as well. And it's just like, it, you're talking about a chief petty officer that doesn't exist like this identity wise like if we're looking at the entire organization that's not our identity whether it's supposed to be or not <laughs> you can make an argument that the mission vision and guiding principles as is dictate that it should be who we are but it's not so like it's because it talks about like humility and and uh, genuineness and authenticity and stuff. So it's like there's humility is not a primary trait of the chief's mess as a whole as it stands today. And I mean, one look at the Internet should be <laughs> like evidence enough. I mean, you can make an argument for all the crap I have in this room is evidence enough that humility is not a primary uh, part of the primary source code or if you will, or the DNA, I guess. But um yeah, I, it's the stickers, the coins, the shirts, the f catchphrases, the ceremonies for every... It's just, like, different uniforms, better parking, like, all, it's, like, humility, really? That's, really? That's what we're going with? And I'm not saying we shouldn't be making that, like, that's 100% one of the corrections that needs to get made, but to act like that's part of our, our current identity is, is laughable. Um, so, yeah, I mean... 
a lot of this memo in particular talks just about um, a general like puffing our chest lines about how great chiefs are, which contradicts the humility thing right off the bat in paragraph one. Uh, today on our watch in this decisive decade, our nation is facing real global adversarial threats. So it's kind of going into like the national defense strategy perspective on things. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the world. And if the, if it pops off, we're going to be at war for reals and it's going to be like world war two, but in the modern era or whatever. And it's like, okay, like I, I think that's a thing that should get talked about, but more in like a, Hey, why aren't we focusing on war fighting competency instead of, you know, which he, he has in his, uh, one of his other memos for his agenda or whatever. Uh, so that's, you know, I mean, he recognizes it as an issue, so that's good. Um, but it's this vague paragraph, like it le- legitimately says, be prepared. I am charging every chief petty officer and future chief petty officer to commit to personal excellence, whatever that means, and to get uh, after the behaviors of substandard performance, training, and motivation within our ranks. Okay, so you're admitting that those problems exist. What are they? How would you like us to get after them? Like I, there's, it's, you know, it, with today's threats, there's no room for mediocre leadership in our mess. Okay, well then why are you putting out mediocre memos? Like I, I just like, uh, it's, I, I don't doubt that he has more to say about these things. He's just not saying it. And it, it that's what's so frustrating is like you fire out these like super vague memos and a lot of it really is bluster. It's like, um, I don't know, like it, it's the f- like, you know how you're discouraged from like flowery words and tricky phrases and block 43 of evils. It's kind of like that. Like the, a lot of this is just fluff. It's just like completely uh, like pointless word salad that doesn't get to the, the root of anything, doesn't actually provide any real guidance, doesn't provide any detail on how you would like to me to execute these incredibly vague things you're saying, doesn't provide resources or processes or, or anything towards getting after these things except for, oh, hey, have a conversation about these things that you could argue the competency is not even really there to have a robust conversation on these things. So it's like, I mean, I like it. And and I don't, if, and this is a big if, like big asterisk, highlight, like if, if the people in that room are, are actually open and honest about what's going on inside their head, I think you could have a really great conversation. Because when I say the competency is not there, it's not... It's not necessarily that I mean all these chiefs are, are dumb or, or don't understand these ideas. It's just that within the culture and the kind of norms of the chief's mess, people aren't going to talk about it because they're afraid that they're going to get ostracized because that's not actually the identity of the chief's mess. So to say we're going to have this like open and honest and robust conversation without some kind of like a forced function with like you almost at this point need like an outside entity to be involved, to force the function by facilitating the conversation of like, these are the things we're going to talk about and these are important. And even then it's going to be like pulling teeth to get these chiefs to say what they may already privately hold as beliefs and think is true. It's like, but trying to exist within that organization, especially after that facilitator then leaves, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's tough. It's t- it's going to be tough to have meaningful conversations. I'm not saying it can't happen, um, and I think it's a good idea to try. So that's a positive in these moments for sure. I just i I struggle to understand. Like, I would I would much rather they have like they multiply this fleet CPO training team by like ten temporarily and just say, okay, here's the memos. Here's my priorities here's the redefinition of the creed and or mission vision guiding principles or just like an update or whatever and okay so go out and start redefining the culture of the chief's mess by doing these facilitated trainings providing resources documentation blah 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 blah. like bombard them with the the direction we're now headed in whether you like it or not and and have those conversations facilitated with someone external in the room that is is there with that agenda of like, hey, this is what we're doing now. Get on board. I think that would be better. I understand that requires resources and stuff, but like at some point they're going to have to rip off the bandaid and just start committing money and people to this. Um, yeah, and then every one of us will have an active role in advancing culture to build our Navy's people, leaders, teams, uh, winning combat, sacred responsibility. I just, and like reconnecting to our roots. What does that mean? <laughs> like, 
with this sacred responsibility of mine to referring to the, you know, we're going to have an active role in advancing our culture to build our leaders, teams for his ability to win in combat. Um, the, like that we, it's imperative that we as a mess reconnect to our roots. What roots? What are we talking about? And like, if you mean like the, the short talk, cheap petty officer roots. Okay. I'm on board. I love it. But like, you're not telling me anything. What are our roots? It's like, it's like saying standards, like maintain the standard. Okay. What are you talking about? What does that mean? You can't just say that and expect everybody's just going to be like, Oh, okay. And like, go find the standard and maintain it. Like, it's not, that's not how this, like, you have to like, what is the standard? Communicate it. Let me know how you would like that done and I'll go do it. But like, you can't just say this vague, like one liners and, and expect everybody to just know what that means. Uh, in doing so, we must change the status quo mindset in how we think, act and communicate. Okay. What does that mean? I, okay. I'll hold my breath for the next memos. In doing so, I already said that. Additionally, we must set the course and steer away from organizational drift caused by years of outsourcing our anchors, whatever that means. Like, what is outsourcing your anchors? Like, how? What does that mean? Who's outsourcing their anchors and how are they doing it? Because if I could fucking outsource my anchors, like, <laughs> if I could multiply myself, I'd think about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because, like, these people are overwhelmed, pulling chunks of their hair out. Like, if I could... <laughs> wait a minute, there's a way I, can I hire a personal assistant on the Navy's dime? Like <laughs> I said, I, I got to get a laugh out of that line just cause I'm like, well, I can outsource this. That's loud. Like, <laughs> and I, I think he means outsourcing the responsibility and, and stuff, which obviously you don't want to do, but I'm just, I got to laugh out of it because it was funny. Like just the idea of like, wait a minute, I could have, I could have just got more people to help. <laughs> Um, it's kind of that thing the chief slugs go through where they're like, think they have to do everything on their own and the mess wants some ask for help. I, I got a kick out of that. Um, anyway, uh, it, and it's like, yeah, chiefs are first and foremost to be strong leaders and experts in our specialty. What does that mean? Like, and it, it, again, like sneak peek at the next memo, the character one talks about like, so one of the other memos from his priorities are like technical expertise is the number one priority. And then it, in the next, in the next memo, the character one, it says that characters, the, like the number one priority. It's just as it, like it says technical expertise can't be the only priority. Oh, like you five seconds ago, you just said this is the number one priority, but now you're saying character is the number one priority as well. It's like if everything's the priority, nothing's the priority. That's half the problem. But here we are. Um, and then he just says, you know, I'm going to send three more letters. Uh, blah, blah, blah. All chief petty officers and selectees must be present, right? So it's just, he just mentions he's going to send the three additional letters, one of which is the character one that I'll do next. Um, and then there's going to, you know, presumably be two more um, on some other things that are all going to be the number one priority and somehow not at the same time. And you're not going to have any idea how to accomplish them until more details provided. I like, I, I don't. Uh oh, my microphone's glitching. Um, I I don't understand. I just I just don't understand. I I don't. I don't understand what what anyone thinks is being accomplished with these memos. Um, just because there's no plan for clarification, there's no plan for policy, there's no plan for any kind of supporting structure or program or, or just anything like just elaborate in a meaningful way. Like, cause a, a one page memo and it's like, he's trying, like he's purposely releasing only one page at a time. I don't think any of these, I'd have to check them all again, but I don't think any of them are more than one page. And it's like, what, why, <laughs> like, why, why are you limiting yourself to that? Like, why not release a 12 page memo? with or like a or like a three page memo with enclosures or something I don't know like something with some kind of meaningful detail in it um I wish you would have spent the last year leveraging the the McPon leadership mess to like work on this stuff like create uh like you could have come in and I'm sure he already had them written down like he could have come in with his uh priorities that he has and then spent the first year building that policy memo instruction whatever um, and this would be the release of that and have some substance to it 
beyond just this word salad because it's 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 too vague, man. Like there are some lines in here that are like, okay, tell me more, and then he doesn't, and it's or he like makes some weird shift that doesn't make any sense, and I freak out about it. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't see how any chief on the deck plate is going to get any value out of this whatsoever. I mean, maybe those conversations uh, that are going to be a forced function during the season. There's so like, you know, it's a conversation amongst people. I mean, that's better than not. Like, so I, I like the idea of doing that, but okay. Where, cause the other part of it's like, where's the accountability that it's even happening? Like, are you, are they reporting it up? Are you reporting completion to like your region CMC or your squadron CMC or whatever? And like, is it a, just a check in the box or is it like you're providing feedback? Like, this is what we talked about. These are some of the good ideas that came out of it. These are, this is some of the feedback or the pushback or whatever. Because otherwise, what's the point? Because, I like, if, if you allow that, like, such a loose construct that it, it's either non-accountable, period, or it's just a check in the box. Like, yep, got it done, CMC. We talked about it. Which is probably what, what's happening. Uh, it, all these command SELs that are responsible for making sure these conversations happen, it's just like, yeah, chief's training, at select E training, just make sure they talk about it. And the chiefs will all have to be there. So I can say that everybody was there, but like, otherwise, yeah, don't change anything. And that's, what's going to happen. And part of that is the leadership and confidence. Part of it's just like an apathy. Like, I don't want to say laziness because these people are, are overwhelmed, slammed, busy, 99.9%, 99.9%. So it's not, it's like a, I got so much other shit to do, you know, that, yeah, just make sure you do that thing so that I can report it up and then I can cross it off my to-do list and go do the 10 million other things that I, I need to do. And, and that includes that command SEL. So it's like, I don't even like fault them for it. Like it's gross, but at the same time, like I understand I get it. It's the same reason why PO Indoc face planted, and if it even happened at all, it's the same reason why Enlic ELD being mandatory is probably not going to work. It's the same reason why they waive the SEA requirement for eights and nines every year. It's like everything that they do in this lane just gets kind of ignored or falls by the wayside because it's it's not impl- it's not able to be implemented in any kind of a realistic way because they don't provide any of the resources to do it. So why are we even making a requirement <laughs> until you do it? Like you have, there has to be resources behind this stuff or it's meaningless. You're just speaking into the void. And that's why these memos irk me so bad, but I don't know. Maybe he'll shock me and unroll some cool policy or mechanism or teams or what? I don't know. Whatever. I can hold my breath though. Um, I'm going to pivot now uh, to there's a couple ideas I've had in my head recently of, so I, I've been in this weird spot where um, I talk about the chief season stuff very openly. I'm critical of it for what I still to, I like unshakably believe are valid reasons and that, that change needs to be made, that leadership and competence is the biggest problem that, you know, like trying to, trying to put this on the mess that the selectees are from. Like I almost, I'm getting to the point now where I, I almost think you should just kill the chief season in the in the version that it's in now and make regional um, there should be like regional they could be like pilot or uh, not pilot um, satellite campuses of like the Navy Community College or and like ELD or a combination of both whatever or like just some subordinate campus of the War College via SEA but like I think there should just be regional brick and mortar academies that are staffed by, um, I mean, I, I would argue retirees and veterans, but like you could also, you know, staff them with, uh, reservists and, or active duty to the extent possible, even though Manning's a shit show right now. So trying to, you know, trying to argue for something like that right now is probably not realistic. Um, but I think you, you could start by leveraging retirees and, and veterans and then scale up you know, the, the active duty participation as Manning allows, but it's on the staff side of it, on like faculty side of it. But I, I just think you just need to take it off their hands where it's like when they are selected for chief, they go spend a couple of weeks at this academy, uh, when time allows. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what that looks like, but I think you could 
promote somebody to chief, just like you promote somebody to first class, and then they go to an academy and get the knowledge that they need as soon as they possibly can. You could put a time on that. Um, I, you know, it's going to get waived a lot, but you could say like within a year or something. But I just like and like ELD, where it's like along the way, you're going to catch those leadership development trainings. I don't. The chief season could be that. I mean, it could be you will go catch the two week CPO leadership course and and build in the the chief season stuff that has value into that. But I'm just at this point where it's like. I don't think you can put this on the mess anymore. Like, I don't think the, and when I say that, I mean the the local mess. So like you're at a command and you get these CPO selectees and then all of a sudden you have this just enormous time suck of the chief season in addition to your primary duties. So like something's got to give, you're not going to, you're not magically capable of, of doing 40 hours of work in two days, you know, and still sleeping and, and, your family not falling apart and your primary duty still happening. So it's just like, how, like the not, it's, it's ridiculous. And then, um, but I'm also in this place where like, so I'm, I am vocal, I'm open and honest about everything and I don't regret a, a, any of it. However, um, I'm starting to see some things that, uh, m- don't make me question it, but make me, it's just frustrating and it makes me kind of feel something adjacent to guilt uh, as far as like, because again, I don't regret it and I think it's necessary because I think it needs to change, but because it hasn't changed yet, a lot of these so people that have been selected that have been podcast listeners are f- like extremely frustrated with how initiations happening because they kind of know the emperor has no clothes. Um, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about like, how do I mitigate that? Because I feel bad because I, I don't, I don't, again, I don't regret anything. I, I I think it needs to happen. I think it's all fair criticism. I don't think any of it should be secret. I, I think you should be able to have tough conversations with your selectees when they push back on the things that are happening during, happening during the chief season and not be like, disappointed in them for daring to challenge the sanctity of the mess and the initiation season. But I, it's like, I feel like the experience of the chief season for all its faults, it can be productive. And there, there are definitely moments because there are, are, um, there are just benefits to share diversity in a group, but there's also like the, because I like I point at the mess as an organization as being dysfunctional within a mess. I mean, you could have a really great mess individually, like your whole mess could be an anomaly. I've been there. Right. Or and what's more common for sure is that you have a bunch of great chiefs within a mess that's, you know, kind of eh, or like maybe even substandard based on the overall culture. But there's a bunch of really strong leaders in that mess. And so those people can add a lot of value as well, just in those in those interactions and maybe they're the ones running the season. So the season itself will be much better than you expect. And so what I'm getting at is, is effectively, I can't, I kind of came to this conclusion that, um, if you're out there and you're a listener of the podcast and you were selected this year or any subsequent year after, and you listen to everything that I, I have to say about it and arrive at this place where you're just like, well, this is bullshit. And I don't want to do this because D gut says it's stupid and all these people are incompetent. So why should I pay attention or anything like that? Or why should I engage with these people because they're going to treat me this way? I say to you, the only reason that you know that to be true is because I told you, you, you are going, that's important because you're going to get so much pushback if you're extremely vocal uh, about you know, the mess being broken or the mess being dysfunctional or leadership incompetence or any of those things during the chief season. And you're, you're having a hard time engaging and, and kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt um, because of all the things you've heard me say. You only know those things to be true because I said it, right? What if I'm wrong? And I'm not saying that I believe I'm wrong, but I, I, I've been a champion of this concept for a really long time. I could be it's possible. Again, I, you can tell even by the voice inflection just now, I don't believe I'm wrong, right? But I could be. And that's an important point that I really want everybody 
that's a selectee right now to carry with them if they're listening to the podcast is like, you need to go up into these things with an open mind. Worst case scenario, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, but like <laughs> worst case scenario, God, I'm saying these could be flipped, but worst case scenario, you go into it with an open mind and you're pleasantly surprised. Well, no, that would be the best case scenario. So <laughs> I got him. I'm confusing myself. Worst case scenario, you go in, you get what you expected, but in in going in with an open mind, allowing the season to happen as it does, um, and just engaging with it the best that you can. And let's say like everything sucks, everything goes off the rails, it's toxic, all the things that you hear, right? The meme page stuff. You can still learn a lot, right? And I've talked about this a bunch on the podcast as a concept before. Is is pull the leadership lessons from the negative experiences of like, this happens. This is why it shouldn't happen. This is what I'll never do when I'm in the position. Here's the lesson here is like, this is why you don't do this. And, and though that scar tissue, I, I, like, I wish it didn't happen, but at the same time, the, the things I believe in the most fervently are because I have scar tissue. Like I have some experience that burned it into me that I will never do that when I'm a leader or when I'm a chief or when I'm a whatever. Right. So there can be a lot of value in those negative experiences. It's sometimes you just need to uh, step on the landmine to learn the lesson. Like I I can show you how to avoid all the pitfalls, but there are lessons that people just need to learn the hard way sometimes. And I, I, again, I kind of wish that it wasn't that way because it is a negative experience. It does leave that, those, that scar tissue. Um, and you don't always get a productive response like the, from the, the, adversity, you know, like sometimes people turn that around and and then treat other people poorly because it happened to them. Right. And we don't want that. So it's not always positive, but there are leadership lessons to be learned there. So that worst case scenario is you go with an open mind. It happens. It's exactly what you expected it to be because you listen to the podcast and um, you pulled a bunch of leadership lessons learned and you got a really great picture of what it really is firsthand and what you don't like about it. And now your involvement going forward on the chief side of things can be coming from that perspective of, I didn't like that when it happened to me. So I think we should do something differently. And you can exert whatever influence you have the first and then the second year and then third year, maybe you're running the season, maybe you're a sponsor, maybe you're whatever. And you, you will have you like, you have a voice, you get, you've got a vote in how that goes. So, um, that's worst case scenario, best case scenario is you're pleasantly surprised. You go into it and your mess is an anomaly. Your mess is super high functioning, has a bunch of really amazing leaders. Maybe your perception of them wasn't as great, but when you get on the other side of it, you learn, oh, that's why they do that. Okay, now I understand. Or, and, and like, there, because there are, there are things, even in a high functioning messes that used to piss me off. And then when I got on the other side and I was, I was like, oh, I get it now. I understand why you can't tell me that or why. Um, that thing happened that way and, and I didn't like it, but now I get the whole picture. Like there's information you don't have. So, um, best case scenario, you get in there, you do it. And then you just start having all these aha moments and, and you learn and you get to engage with these people at more as people and peers than as like the superiors. And you learn a lot. And you get made a better leader and then you, now you get to be part of that mess and you get to take those lessons elsewhere. Right. That was probably more my experience, right. Where like there was a time where I, I mean, I wanted to strangle my cob. I didn't understand why he was always coming after me. And then I figured it out and I was like, Oh, he's not, I just need to communicate better. Um, and there was some other stuff too, where like, uh, it, it, you get even after you're in anchors, like there is some truth to that idea of, oh, you'll understand later, like it'll click later. You know, there is some truth to that. I don't think that should be the entire, like the entire list of learning objectives is, oh, you'll, you'll just, you'll understand later, like, um, pointed barbs and whatnot. But like, yeah, I, I, there is some truth to that. Uh, not everybody gets it just because I said it. They have to then experience it later and be like, oh, that's what he's talking about. Okay. So what I'm what I guess the the whole point of this little monologue on on interacting with the chief season is go in with an open mind. Like give it a chance. Cause I, I might be wrong. 
And you, for, you know, like, I, I love y'all, but if you've never gone through it, you've got no idea what the fuck you're talking about. You just don't. You need to let that happen. Like, you know, because you know, you have a little context because of what I've told you, but I'm one voice in a sea of, of chiefs. So it's like, maybe I'm wrong. And again, I don't believe I'm wrong, but of course I don't. I'm open to someone convincing me of that fact and I'll have those discussions, but you need to have those discussions. You need to have those experiences. You can't just decide and having never meaningfully interacted personally with this process or been a member of this group that it's bad. Like you need to go, you need to go interact with it yourself, do your own research, that kind of shit. Like you need to, you need to go through this experience on your own because maybe you decide that I'm the one that's full of shit and that's fine. Like I'm okay. I'll be fine. I don't agree, but I'll be, you know what I mean? Like it's okay. You're allowed to do that. I'll love you anyway. Like, but you got to give the chief's mess. You got to be, you got to be open enough to give the chief's mess that chance. Like, let them fail. Go in there, open mind, meaningfully interact. You, you like I, I say about the chief season all the time, and I, I still mean this to this day, is you get out of it what you put into it. So put into it. Give it a, give it a really good try. Give it a good shot. Put all your effort and, and, care and understanding and just have everything your all your senses open and be willing to like have that conversation and and that interaction that is the chief season and and then if it if it doesn't work and it's a shit show or whatever then you can then you can go down that road but you can also affect meaningful change because you're going to be a member of the mess it, you can't be you can't affect the change that you want to. Like, you can be a vocal critic of the mess not being in it, of course, right? But if you think you're going to have any influence on the mess, not being, not having been or being a member of it currently, right? It's, they're, why would they listen to you? If you've never even participated in the chief season, how do you know what you're talking about? Because I told you? Like, okay, but like, you've never gone through it. And I have, I, me, D Guts, has, hasn't gone through every single Chiefs season ever in every region and every command ever with every possible composition of a Chiefs mess that exists. So maybe give them a fucking chance. And I know it sounds like I'm, I'm flipping my like position or something. I'm not. But. I don't know that I vocalize this part of it enough. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is like, you got to give them a chance to fail. You just, you do. You can't just decide you don't like them because I said so. That's not, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Give them the opportunity to teach you and to prepare you to be a chief. Because like, even if you don't agree with a lot of what's happening or a lot of what they're saying, that doesn't mean that they don't also have value to add. Those two things can coexist. So give them a chance. And then when you get on the other side of it, write down all the things you didn't like. And then now you're in a position to influence those things going forward because you could be a sponsor or you could be the chief season lead or you could run like a committee or whatever the hell, like everybody kind of does it a little differently, but you can be in a position to in, like influence change on the things that you thought were not productive or weren't, didn't ha add value or have meaning or whatever. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, and this, you know, this almost could be its own podcast, but is the idea that um, there, there's this thing that happens during the chief season. Someone brought it to my attention recently, and it's not that I didn't know it happened. It's just the way that we talked about it um, kind of uh, incited this thought process in my head of part of the reason why. Um, I think the chief season can be so ineffective and, and I say can be because like I just said, it's not always, but it can be, I think one of the primary reasons it can be so ineffective and, and largely is, is the theater aspect to it. There's a thing that happens during the chief season and it's like a, it's like carryover energy from the tradition of change days back when the chief season was more 
like the wild west the hazing the easing up eating out of troughs the you know getting disgustingly drunk and doing lewd things to their charge books and all that kind of stuff where it was more of like a the 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 spirit of it was you're getting hazed into a fraternity um i think it's kind of like some residue of that is this there's this thing that ha- and it happened to like i recognize it pretty readily because it happened on submarines too there's this culture amongst uh submariners where when you're earning your submarine dolphins there's this like there used to be this like hazing aspect to it like i got my fish tacked on and drinking your fish just like pilots drink their wings sometimes or used to i'm not saying they do now i don't know <laughs> or like i think army guys do it with their jump wings it's a it's a military thing that was pretty common less so nowadays but pretty common for a long time and on submarines there was like a hazing aspect to it like you just it, you're kind of you're joining the fraternity you know now it's a what do you what's a gender neutral term for ter- for fraternity uh, I don't know, organization? I don't know. I'll think of something. I feel like there is one. Anyway, because um, now we have women on submarines, that's my point. So, uh, it's, I, I recognize it readily, was the point of the submarine thing. So, the when I see it with chiefs, within the chiefs mess, right, there's just this energy shift when results are about to come out where everybody's getting like, oh, I can't wait, you know? And it's like, well, why can't you wait? Because you're so excited to develop leaders and install leadership competency in these people? Or is it because you're excited to fuck with them? And it's that... uh, That thing needs to get surgically fucking removed. You know, like, just rip it out. Because I've had a few people... And these, these are people who have not, you know, they're selects. They don't, they've never gone through this before. That have relayed stories to me about um, these interactions where they're like, they'll be having a conversation with a chief. And it's totally normal. And then something will happen where it becomes more of a selectee uh, centric engagement versus just like a sailor to chief engagement. And it's like the energy in the room shifts and the body language and tone and manner of the peep, the chiefs that they were talking to like shifts. It's like, it's like they get in character because now they're acting, you know what I mean? And it's, and it, I don't know. I don't know if all chiefs recognize that they do it. I've certainly done it where you're, you're like playing a role. Like I've been in a room and, and I always like, I looked at it, And this is why I don't think I recognize it as negative until like recently Um, is when I would do it, it would be for a reason. Like I, and I'm not trying to make, say I'm better than anybody else or anything. And like a lot of, I've seen a lot of people do this as well. So it's not like it was just me. A lot of the awesome chiefs that I was around would do this too, where they would like it, there was like a theater thing to it where, but I wanted to drive this point home. And so like, Maybe I get like a little louder, a little more passionate, a little higher energy. Maybe I even yell, right? And I'm not actually mad. I just know that this like selectee needs this type of energy for this point to get driven home. So I'm using that tool that I have. And that's the way that I looked at it, right? But there's this other like darker side to it where it's like, it's like the, the, shtick you have to do to get somebody to sign your charge book right which i don't make people do because i think it's silly it's kind of funny and it's kind of part of the process like the how like what time is it and how long have you been a chief and stuff but though and i think those are more just like fun and like i don't have any issues with those things because i don't think they uh i don't think there's any harm in them where the introducing yourself part like where you're like Somebody's coming to you for this very, like, very meaningful interaction where you are giving, putting a charge in the charge book. And, and what comes with that is usually a pretty great, meaningful conversation about leadership and about being a chief and maybe some of their story and some of the things they screwed up and what they learned from those things. And it humanizes this, these chiefs, right? 
I think that that's introductory thing. It's like you have to memorize it and you have to do it. And it's it's ridiculous and is a barrier to having that really meaningful interaction. And, and there are times where um, if you don't get it right, that chief will tell you, we'll come back later when you can. Like come back later when you can get it right. And then maybe that opportunity never presents itself. And then I miss out on that interaction and that charge. So that those things like that, I'm just like I, that type of theatric I don't love, like, I don't think it really has a place. Um, but also that the, th- the darker side of the theatrics part where you're, you think you need to act some kind of way because you're a chief and they're select. Um, so I don't like the term genuines, you know, like, I think it's stupid. Like we all know who the chief and who the selectee is. So like, why do we have to like add another term on top of it and then you do all that honor honorable and most honorable and exalted or whatever the fuck they're saying now it's it just it creates it doesn't just create barriers to the meaningful interactions it creates like a greater division it's almost like shining a giant spotlight on the divide that you see on a daily basis between junior sailors and chiefs it's like you're just creating this division and other like they're the others and we're the chiefs and you have to like get accepted and it's like none of that's real like they've been selected by a selection board they've already been told at the release of that nav admin that was approved by cmp that they are worthy of being chiefs this is not a selection process it's already happened all it is is a finishing school for chiefs like we should be just getting them ready to be a chief on day one when they get pit, like day after pinning here we are now you're chief and you need to be ready for that that's what it is but we do a lot of things that contradict that idea that like we treat it like it's a it's a filter like we're it's a selection process like you need to be deemed worthy to be accepted into the mess that is unequivocally bullshit it's not real and I don't like that we have these interactions with these chief selects that effectively alienate them routinely throughout the process and then somehow expect them to one want to be members of it continually like through the whole process we want you to just continually robustly demonstrate to us that you want to be a member of the mess even though we like our messaging to you our behavior is messaging to you throughout the entire process that we don't want you to be a part of the group that you're not worthy you haven't earned it the fuck they haven't they got selected. That conversation's over, right? So now we're at a place where it's like, I just need to get you ready to be a member. I just need to do everything I can for you to understand what this means, the gravity of the situation, the responsibilities you now have, how to do all those things. Like, I get you as ready as I possibly can be. And we waste so much fucking time on theatrics, on bullshit. And that's the... That energy shift in the room when a selectee comes in and have a selectee interaction, like you don't ever talk to sailors that way. Uh, I mean, outside of like maybe a DRB and even then most of the DRBs I was, I was attending the last like five years I was in were very conversational. I mean, if it got like negative, it was a disappointed dad talk more than anything. Um, And so, yeah, I, I, I don't understand why we treat them that way and are then are, are we're then surprised by their response because you get to the chief season like probably week three and everybody looks like whipped dogs tail between their legs they're just sad they don't want to do this anymore they just want it to be over and it's like why why do we allow it to get to that point why isn't the whole thing just value added everybody should be skipping everywhere they go damn near you know like or that should be the goal anyway of like it should be all positive energy it should be all like i'm not saying it shouldn't be hard but it should be all positive energy it should be all making them understand the value making them understand the the need like the importance and the uh like the um i want to say like like it's the impending like shift in responsibility like and i i the word is escaping me but like it's coming <laughs> like pinning's coming no matter what so like we need to get you ready and you need to be grasping as much of these uh, as much of the concepts as you can 
as fast as you can because we've only got six weeks. But yet we waste a lot of it doing things that just alienate these people and make it, or making them run around do stupid shit. Like, and, and some of it can be fun. Like the egg division thing, I always think is hilarious. A lot of times people fumble the ball there and, and they like make the eggs and then none of the things that are associated with it, like all the, all the, you know, hey, your sailor went UA, do the paperwork. Hey, your, this sailor died in a, in a ARI do the Keiko thing and, and write a report shit and write an award and write an eval. And like, there's all these tasks, build a division officer notebook. There's all these tasks that you'll do as a chief and you kind of need to know how to do. Sorry, my back hurts because I'm old. <laughs> um, and you get to kind of go through those exercises if the egg division activity is done correctly. But a lot of times it's not a lot of time, all that, all the meaningful stuff falls to the wayside and they're just goofing around with these eggs. And it's like, what are we doing? And that's kind of why it's like, and, it, and again, I go back to like some of the stuff, like you'll be in a training, right? And they'll be doing the egg division thing. And it's like, somebody will smash one of the eggs and be like, Oh, this guy died in a car accident. You need to do the paperwork, notify the family via the Keiko procedures. All stuff. But then no one follows up. Like that person can sit in the training and give you the tasker, but then they go off and do the 10 million other things that they have to do and completely forget. They even gave you that tasker. And then because no one holds you accountable for it, you never, do it or maybe you try to do it but you don't know how and you screw it up and then they just tell you you fucked it up and and kind of like give you some shit about it and then they just forget about it so it's like it, it's like the loop never gets closed because it's not a formal curriculum nobody's actually responsible for anything really it's like and there's no accountability for the taskers really unless somebody again like there's sometimes people that run the season will be really great at it but it's like yeah. It's this is why I'm starting to I'm starting to warm up to the idea of like it being an external entity running the chief season because it's like I don't it does it's not getting done correctly. So um, I wanted to bring up that energy thing. It's like when you're for the chiefs that listen, it's like when you're interacting with selects, you should be using every so- single solitary second for authentically communicating all the things that you can think would add value to their experience as a member of the Chiefs Mess. Leadership development, education, um, being vulnerable about a story, maybe. Um, just whatever they need from you, do as much. You should be using every ounce of time you have to develop them. And that energy shift where you like create this adversarial thing, like you have to jump through all these flaming hoops before you can access me, it's horseshit. You're just creating a barrier to being able to communicate with these people. And your whatever trust you have at the beginning, it's like you're just eroding that through the whole process, if not fully just like flushing it at the very beginning. So now these people don't want to trust you because every time they interact with you, you're telling them they're a fuck up or dismissing them. You're not ready. Go learn the stupid thing before you can talk to me. Like there's just a lot of shit that happens that... All it does is create barriers to you communicating at all, let alone them trusting you to authentically communicate with them and, and develop them as leaders, which you like you need trust to do that. <laughs> and so it's like it's like from day one, we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. And then we're then when the selectees are a shit show, we're like, look at these sh- look at this shit show. These guys suck. It's like, do they? <laughs> Like people that are responsible for this entire process and their leadership development holistically are they're the fuck ups. They're the ones doing it wrong. Really? I just, I, for the chiefs that are listening, like understand that that's a real thing. And that if you actually care about these people's success as chiefs and as being like functional members of the mess and just getting everything they can out of the, the process of the, of the initiation season, don't interact with them that way. Shut that part of your brain off. That theatrics bullshit, it doesn't have any place, really. Unless you're using it, like I said earlier, like as a tool to just, like, drive the point home. But, like, I can do that authentically without violating their trust. And it's it's a, it's a tightrope. Like, it's a tightrope walk. But you can do it, but it's that's just one tool that you use sparingly. You know what I mean? Like, it's not... It shouldn't be everything. And so you need to, like, 
your default setting should just be authenticity. Just be who you are and authentically communicate with them that you care about them, that you want to develop them as a leader, that you're there for them. They can come to you and ask questions and have discussions. And while you're not going to give them all the answers because sometimes they need to go find it themselves because that's part of the learning is like you need to know where to look and how to find it yourself as a chief. But like they're not going to come to you with their problems and questions and they're not going to trust you both as a selectee, but then as subsequently a member of the mess, they're going to be in the mess actively not trusting you. And we wonder why we're so dysfunctional. Um, yeah, I think, I'll, I think I'll just wrap it up there. That's, I, I've had a lot of thoughts bouncing around in my head as this chief season has unfolded based on my interactions with chiefs and selectees all over the place. Um, and, and just listeners, like the, the selectees I know, but like the listeners and people involved with the podcast as well. So it's just like, it's frustrating because, um, it's like, we don't have any time to waste and we could be doing so much better, even with the handicaps that we have with like time and resources of doing the chief season, you know, like everybody's undermanned everybody's stressed out so it's like the idea that we have to add all this responsibility not just onto the select these plates but then onto the entire messes plate it's a lot and it's like we don't we don't already don't have enough hands to to accomplish the task exactly how it should be so we can't waste any of the time and energy that we do have doing shit that's not productive that doesn't if it doesn't meaningfully move us towards the learning objectives towards the goal of developing this person as a chief. What are we doing? Um, yeah. And, uh, as always, if you want to discuss it, have some feedback, think I'm an idiot, hit us up. Don't give up the shit podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message us. Don't give up the shit podcast. You can DM us on Instagram, Reddit, or discord at DGS podcast. If you want to support us, you can go to DGS podcast.com. There's a donate button on the website. Uh, you can also go to Don't Quote the Ship Apparel. That's dgutsapparel.com. Get yourself some Naval Pride and Heritage gear you'll actually wear in public. We got all kinds of cool stickers. I got some new ones in the other day. I got the CT ones for the homies. For like, I got Ariana and Desiree, who are both Chief Selects. I'm so proud. But I got the CT Super Seer Squirrel sticker. Uh, it's a holographic sticker as well. I don't know if you can see that through. It's still wrapped in plastic, but. Uh, and I got, you know, all the other ones, all kinds of shirts and all kinds of cool stuff, hoodies, all the things. Uh, so go check out dgetsapparel.com. Uh, and then probably the best one, patreon.com slash dgetspodcast. Pick one of the five tiers, a bunch of dope benefits, and it helps us pay the bills and expand the platform. Uh, so check out patreon.com slash dgetspodcast. Become a patron today. Uh, if you can't afford to spend any money, that's fine. There's plenty of awesome ways to support us. Just like, share, subscribe, review on all the platforms for all the things. Subscribe on YouTube, share the videos, tag your friends. Anything you can do, share the social media posts, whatever. Uh, all the things help uh, us grow organically and get the word out to the people that need it. And that's it. That's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening, and don't give up the ship. Hey, shout out to all our Level 5 patrons, Victoria Livingood, William McIver, and Mark Gallagos, to all our other patrons. We really appreciate your support. Helps to pay all the bills, expand the platform, and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Please hit the like button, drop a comment down below on what you thought and subscribe to the channel.